lifestyle designers, this is Gavin here with Secrets of Longevity.com. So this video has been a long time in the coming. Uh, it's definitely been something I've been looking at with increased uh, scrutiny over the past, I'd say, whole year. Uh, but it's definitely been one that's been an ongoing interest of mine for many years, uh, more in casual understanding and uh, gathering of information on the topic. But really, I wasn't applying good, solid reasoning to my analysis of this thing, which is public versus private healthcare and what's most optimal. And I think at this point I'm ready to make some more conclusory statements. You might have seen me vlog about it in the past on um, my past channels that I vlogged on. I would definitely not recommend seeing those videos. I'm almost embarrassed that they're still up, but uh, it's just a moment in time and my current understanding of the way things were at that time. You might have heard me touch on and talk about the topic uh, over the last few months as I've been incorporating some more of this uh, type of analysis that I'm mostly using now, which is looking at things from an ethical standpoint first before getting political and trying to figure out what's right and wrong and fair versus unfair and all those things. So for the sake of argument, in this video, we're going to ignore the core truth that socialism in any form is violence. And what I mean by that is that to force other people, and you might be included in the other people, to give someone else money, meaning the government, that then redistributes it through various services, is unethical because it goes against uh, the most basic principle that we could choose to take on, which is the non-aggression principle. And if you're for aggression, well then you're for aggression. You have to admit that. If you're for socialism, you're for people imposing themselves and initiating something on, by force on other people, regardless of whether they want to participate in it or not. Because if they were participating voluntarily, then what's the point of having this rule or this law? Because you could just say, oh, everyone does this voluntary, so we're good to go with that. So essentially, forcing people to donate to charity at gunpoint is not charity. Threatening them with uh, kidnapping, arrest, if they refuse to donate, meaning taxes, or even further, if they refuse the kidnapping, they're going to be uh, facing death at gunpoint, then, yeah, there, I personally have a problem with that. And that's the core foundation as to why I now have the stance that I do. But if we're going to set that whole argument aside, the ethical foundational argument, and just look at the you know, pros and cons of public versus private healthcare, and really understand that it's a range, it's not one or the other, because a lot of people think, oh, Canada's public, US is private, most of Europe is public, sometimes it is a mix of public and private. It's really not that simple because it's such a vast array of things and there's so many different facets that in some cases get switched back and forth. Uh, I believe Germany more recently got dental care turned into a public health uh, initiative. Whereas in Canada, it's always been private. In Canada, the drug and uh, other therapies that you pay on top of, you know, sort of mainstream therapies, whether it's like orthotics or prescription medication, these all are privately run. But then they can also fall under the branch of uh, being covered by health insurance. And health insurance is sort of an in-between, because uh, if you kind of think about it, insurance Although it's voluntary, so it's a private organization doing that, you're still entering into a contract that allows you to do something because there's a whole bunch of people paying into something and just by luck of the draw you know that other people are going to need more of that or use more from the pool or maybe you'll be one of the ones that uses more of it. But that's just what the insurance company gets to decide on what happens with that. So when we think of more mainstream healthcare, uh, there is an insurance company or uh, even if it's public, behind it that is taking everyone's tax money that's submitted in an equal amount and dividing it up amongst everyone uh, to cover everyone. And there's going to be people that use more, there's going to be people that use less. Some people are going to use far less. And as it turns out, the majority of people use far less than what they put into it. So the mentality behind that is that there's a need for equality of outcome as opposed to equal opportunity. So equal opportunity would be there's a level playing field in terms of you have access to all these different things, but you have to contribute and get into those through whatever means necessary. So when it comes to health, 
if it was a completely private system, it would be, you know, you have access to whatever you can afford. If it's equal outcome, then everyone has access to everything equally, but you're going to have detriments uh, to that because you're not going to have access to the absolute best care because you're being treated equally. And there's only limits on that. I mean, yes, if you're having a heart attack, you're going to get uh, faster care in an emergency room in a hospital than someone who has a cough. But there might not be cutting-edge therapies that could either save your life or even uh, prolong your life in the cases where you have an acute problem such as that uh, that wouldn't be available at your hospital just because you know all the hospitals across a certain area get the same amount of funding. But I just wanted to highlight that that private is essentially equal opportunity. Public to anything is usually uh, coming down to equality of outcome. That's the basis of the mentality that uh, wants to have that set up. So as I'm going through this list of these different uh, arguments for or against uh, public versus private healthcare, uh, I'll be numbering off links just as references that you can find in the drop down menu below. And they're just in the numbered order that I put them there. Now topic number one is for me, the core reason how I got into the stance that I'm now at, it was my first sort of aha moment when I realized this that caused me to really question the public healthcare system that I grew up in in Canada, and that's the incentive of having public healthcare. So if you're paying for your health as you go, or even through an insurance company, you have more incentive to take better care of your health than uh, if it's a completely public system where you know, when you get a problem, you go to the doctor and it's provided for you. I mean, yes, some people are more concerned and willing to take care of themselves and be healthy than others. If you're watching this channel, you're probably someone that really takes good care of their health and goes the extra length to learn about, you know, the best diet to eat, the best way to exercise, and all these different lifestyle factors that contribute to better health. And that's wonderful. A common argument against public health care is that the idea that, you know, a smoker who's abusing their body might end up on a list for a lung transplant uh, amongst people who just happen to have gotten lung cancer from other causes and does that seem fair because they didn't take it upon themselves to not smoke to lift some of the burden off the public system and that's a real problem like that goes for any issue is that people who continue to engage in poor lifestyle habits put a burden on the system a big one that's talked about in the US and Canada now is also obesity that's putting a huge strain on systems. Uh, and that's probably one of the major ones uh, of anything that's taking money away from the healthiest people and it's getting put into that. So it's that equality of outcome thing that everyone has equal care even if some people need more care than others. So in this instance, private health care is much preferred because you know that you're going to be paying into your health. You want to eat organic. You want to do all these things. You want to learn. And even when it comes to the research, it's all going to be geared towards improving people's health. There's an often cited, uh, whether it's a quote or just an interpretation of ancient Chinese medicine versus more modern allopathic medicine, is that uh, Chinese doctors were paid to keep their patients healthy. And as soon as a Chinese doctor had a sick patient on their hand, they had to help them, uh, and they weren't paid to help them because they were paid to keep someone healthy. So they had that natural incentive built into whatever ancient system was set up at the time. And while I'm not advocating that kind of a system, that just kind of gives you an idea that if we're treating health problems as opposed to people's lifestyles or rather giving more emphasis to that because there's definitely an appropriate uh, application for all aspects of prevention sort of middle type care or the end result of chronic um, lack of care which would be things like cancer or diabetes these things that we know have um, strong roots in lifestyle factors, but people just do not take that up in their life and end up with these problems. So another thing that had me thinking about that recently was this viral article being passed around on Reddit. It also made its way to Facebook, and it was just the images, but link number one below is an article in the Daily Mail, and it just shows this outrageous hospital bill for someone who had an uh, appendectomy. They had appendicitis, and really that goes to show, yes, there's a major problem with the, that instance and that person's um, having to pay that much for such a simple surgery. The reality of the fact is that I was reading comments on Facebook and on Reddit, and people were saying, for something that is unpreventable, and I was just like, 
you're, you're, you gotta be kidding me. People do not know this simple thing that something like an appendicitis attack is completely preventable when you have good gut health, when you have a proliferation of healthy bacteria, when you have a strong immune system that's in place doing what it needs to be doing. If all those things crash, then you have a higher risk of infection in the body. And in that instance, someone got appendicitis, but you know, they wouldn't have been facing that outrageous bill had they known that, you know, their lifestyle was contributing to that going on in the body. And if they had been instead paying into uh, some natural alternative healthcare practitioners, as well as paying more attention to their own lifestyle, they wouldn't have had this outrageous bill. Yes, there needs to be a better system in place, whether it's a public or private opportunity uh, to not have such an outrageous cost to something like that. But this person just did not have it figured out in their mind that, uh, their health problem was caused by their own self and their own habits. My second point in this video is that there's a common thing that seems to be going around now. I've seen it in viral memes and just a general attitude, but also mentioned specifically in conversations that, uh, and this is largely in part in the U.S. with the push for Obamacare and the left really wants to see it come into play because, you know, health should be a human right. Um, why would it be a human right? A human right is a right to do something. Receiving something is never a right. You have the right for free speech. You have the right for self-defense. You don't have the right to food put in front of you for you to eat. Likewise, it doesn't make sense that you have the right to health care. I mean, yes, we should all have access to it, but it's not really a right because that's depending on other people giving it to you. No one has the right to be given land to live on, to have roof and shelter over their head. If you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, pyramid, there's all these things on the bottom level that you need to just feel secure on the most basic level, which is food, shelter, water, and these things. Healthcare is actually even above that. So even out of the most basic things, we commonly understand these are not rights. These are things that you have to provide for yourself, and that's part of living. Yes, there's people in society that have less of an ability to do that, and we take care of them through our own charitable means. But it's not a right, because if you're alone in the woods, there'd be no one to give that to you. If you were alone in the woods, you'd have the right to say what you want to, you know, passerbys. You'd have the right to defend yourself if a passerby was trying to attack you. But you don't have the right to take from a passerby their food in their backpack, or uh, their water in their backpack. And so this brings me to the idea that uh, within the health system, when it's public, especially in Canada, we see this disparity between the costs of what individual people uh, need for maintaining their health. And this has been a hot topic of debate in the U.S. with the Obamacare coming up. And the major one that I've seen is the talk of men versus women, but also young versus old. And I'd also throw in there that, you know, already sick people versus people who take care of their health. And the idea is that the majority of people who are healthy end up paying for the people who are sick, or people who uh, are young end up paying for the people who are old. And this is if we're talking about everyone paying the same amount. Uh, men end up paying for some of women's costs, because women cost more in terms of health, especially through the reproductive years, especially through menopausal years. I mean, I don't see people saying, well, women should be contributing to the cost of men's car insurance because men cost more in car insurance. So in a way, it's just a tragedy of circumstance, but that doesn't mean we should, you know, hold a gun to people's heads and say, you know, it's unfair that they have to pay more, so we're going to make you pay part of their uh, cost. The same with young versus old or sick versus healthy. We all have these unique circumstances, and some people have better circumstances all around, some people not, and by allowing people to just deal with their life circumstances, they're going to have the ability to overcome those circumstances where it's needed. And when there's shortcomings, there's community, there's charitable support, there's all sorts of things that can come into play and help people out, outside of the narrow idea that it always has to be the government and the state that does this, because generally it's very bad at doing that. So my third point in this video, which is a little bit of a complicated one, is that administrative costs contribute massively to public health care costs. Uh, there are administration costs in private health care in the U.S., but I'd also argue that the U.S. is not a fully private system. People need to understand that, again, it's a um, sliding scale. It's not black versus white. And in Canada, when you actually compare uh, statistics, a lot of people say, oh, actually Canada has lower administration costs, and that's true, but 
you also have to look at what are the administrative costs in the U.S. that are costing so much, and it's largely the insurance company's <laughs> administration costs. So there's a problem within that. If you'd stripped all that away to the bare bones cost of, you know, running healthcare minus all the administration, it's actually cheaper to do it privately than publicly because you have doctors that need to get paid. And yes, doctors need a minor amount of administration in terms of their front desk and nurses and people helping them out. But when you have doctors with government administration on top of their own administration, that without a doubt, just logically, is going to cost more. And interestingly, if you compare Canada's individual administration costs of the private side of Canadian healthcare, so that's workplaces that provide dental to their uh, employees, uh, the insurance companies also provide uh, pharmaceuticals to employees. Sometimes they often cover massage and physiotherapy. The administration there actually costs more than it does in the U.S. So generally the bigger an administration is, the more efficient it is because it's big and can just have these big set rules in place. But when you get a lot of little ones set up, it tends to cost more and that's why in Canada the small administration fees of these insurance companies and things cost more than the U.S. because the U.S. is bigger and incorporates more, it tends to cost less. But when you compare that overall to Canada overall, Canada ends up being cheaper. So I've got a link below to explain that. It's, yeah, like I said, complex, but I think it's pretty clear that real private healthcare would have a lower administration cost than public healthcare. It's just a basic understanding of the way things work. And my point number four ties into the previous point of administration costs is that licensing, which is a massive administration cost, uh, is a big part of the problem that causes elevated costs of healthcare. I was recently going through the healthcare system for some things I was dealing with and you know doing some blood tests and things and even just urinating a cup. Yes, getting blood done, a phlebotomist needs to do that, that's contact with your body. It needs to be a specialized um, job that needs its own pay to represent the risk and training involved in that job. But for me to give a urine sample and hand that to someone, that doesn't need to be a nurse who's getting paid X amount, which is bigger than someone that's doing a lower income type job. That's just one example. Yes, when you're having an ultrasound, you need an ultrasound technician. They go through special schooling and their pay should reflect that. But when you go in to have an ultrasound or any of these other types of things done, there are often you know, people who are the technicians and things doing things that they're doing for reasons I don't completely understand. It would make sense that they could streamline the care by having someone that's paid less do the menial tasks. And if healthcare was truly private and we took government out of it to the point where not even licensing existed, then we would see this happen. And people would go, oh, but licensing ensures, you know, quality of care and things like that. It's like, well, not really. I mean, yes, it's good to have a certification or license in the sense that it gives you the uh, ability to understand yet yes this has been approved that this is generally going to be following some sort of guidelines but that can happen privately if you look at the organic industry um, in, in the food industry there's labels and there's a lot of different types of labels that are now appearing on foods there's the general government organic label which is very costly for farmers and foods to be able to have stamped on their packaging. I just recently saw this study coming out saying that 50% of organic foods have pesticide residues on them. I'd be very curious to see if these are USDA organics because when you consider that privately other labels can come about and if you're a conscious consumer and you understand the integrity of that label then you can look for that label which is perhaps an even higher standard than the government label but actually costs the people producing the product less to have on their package. So they prefer to have that label than trying to go the route of getting the USDA organic label. And the same could be applied for any industry, including healthcare. And it sounds like an extreme idea because it's just so far from what we currently see, but if there was no licensing to enforce doctors being uh, given this specific set of rules, not only could doctors actually start to treat people with more health-promoting lifestyle factors, but we wouldn't have all these things that have to be done by certain types of work when they could be done by more menial task type people. When they could be done by workers that can do more menial tasks for lower pay. And this is not just me trying to say, oh, people shouldn't be paid as much. 
It's just the reality of the situation. If there's a job that is low skill, why not get a low skill worker to do it? It just makes sense in terms of economics. I mean, if that were to occur, the costs and savings would be transferred onto the consumer. Another factor around licensing is that all came about over 100 years ago when there was a lobby by healthcare uh, practitioners, doctors, who were being paid not enough. And while it's good that they were being paid more because their level of knowledge, time and money put into schooling and continuing their knowledge and understanding of things, that all needs to be paid for. And it makes sense that such a specialized profession gets paid a certain amount compared to other professions. And in some cases, there's jobs that can be done by workers that are not specifically doctors or nurses. So in Canada, under our public health care system, and it might be different in different systems, and it can definitely be set up differently, but doctors are paid roughly by how many patients they see. It's changed over the years. I believe it's difficult to get really accurate information on this, but there's not a huge difference within each uh, type of medical profession. So yes, family doctors are a set amount. Specialists generally make more. Psychiatrists often make the least amount because they're not as hands-on. But within each subsection, there's not a huge difference in what people can make. And they're often paid by 50-minute chunks or whatever the minimum amount of time is as low as they're allowed to go with their patients. And what this causes is, you know, sort of a salary cap. Uh, it would make sense that within any profession, you can progress and keep progressing as your career goes on and then you retire. And if you're of a different mindset and different lifestyle, maybe you don't, you know, climb the ladder quite as rapidly or you just lose interest in your career and you do it less and you start to make less or you stay the same. That should all be reflected in a profession. That just makes sense. That's how private industry works and that creates the incentive for better care, a better product. This is real competition, but it's eliminated by a public system. Another major problem this creates, if there's a cap, is that doctors start looking for other sources of income. Uh, they might become more of a public figure, which is all great. They might write a book and do things that route, but a lot of them also go the route of uh, taking money from pharmaceutical companies. Some people actually think this doesn't occur. Of course it occurs. They get paid to, you know, to meet certain quotas for patients getting on certain types of drugs. Uh, they get incentives to the unpaid ways such as you know free vacations or they go on vacations to conferences in the Bahamas and they're allowed to take their family with them. And this is just the reality of what happens uh, when there's a cap on healthcare and when it's monopolized and so tied into the pharmaceutical industry which is then supported by government and if you take government out of it you'd have doctors that go that route, you'd have doctors that would go a more naturopathic route have doctors that would go a more traditional Chinese route, you'd have more doctors working alongside preventative therapies, you'd have such a big range of choices that the consumer would have freedom of choice and once again that's really where my heart got into this is because you try and deal with healthcare and incorporate your own interests of holistic sustainable health into it and there's just no place for it. I invest my own time and money into preventative care but it's not reflected in whatever contribution I make to the system. I still end up contributing the same amount even though I am taking less out of the system for my better health. And still when I go to the doctor's office and I want to get certain hormonal tests that are uh, rare or rarely even asked for, because I'm not displaying the symptoms that would normally require someone to have that test done, I'm told I have to pay for that. It's really bizarre. Or I might go in to have an STD check and because I had an STD check in the last six months, I'm not allowed to do it again unless I pay for it. It's just a very bizarre system uh, when it becomes public. So there's a link below just to describe what doctors make in Canada, some of the stats and the general uh, politics that's occurring at the moment uh, on the topic. Point number six on my list is that the U.S. is really not a private healthcare system, fully at least. Uh, I've been mentioning that throughout the video. and the biggest factor for that, I believe, is because when you want to go to a specialist, you don't really see the competitive prices or really out there marketing to present what products and services are being offered by different doctors within their own niches. So this does happen in certain industries like the cosmetic industry and the laser eye surgery 
industry, even to some extent the dental industry, although perhaps a little bit not as much. And so what we need to have happen is more movement towards that to really see whether private healthcare works. And there's a great interview below, in the links below, uh, it's a YouTube video. I'll actually link to it here as well. It's with Stefan Molyneux of Freedom Main Radio. I posted in past videos, talked about this, and it's a great interview showing a specialist in a certain area of the U.S. that's trying to get uh, some more uh, competition happening which uh, provides cheaper care because when there's competition, prices come down and also the elevation of quality goes up. And not only does quality go up, but you also see less of the unnecessary surgeries happening. Sometimes things get prescribed that are unnecessary. A lot of that happens uh, with more minor surgeries that people encounter. A lot happens in female health, unfortunately. You hear about that quite a bit. Um, happens just as much in public health care as it does in the semi-private system that the U.S. has. But if we were to move back towards a more private, completely private system, this, in theory, would be completely eliminated, or to the most part, hopefully, largely eliminated if the competing markets existed and really strive to step up their game. I think that another problem with the public healthcare system is that different things get put into it that you might just never have a need for. And if it's a more of a lifestyle thing, uh, and we could say that your, your choice to have a lifestyle of eating junk food that causes cancer, say, is a burden on the system. Another one is um, things like, in Canada, sex changes are covered. Now, do not take this the wrong way. Do not be the type of person that goes and tries to make a sophistical argument saying that I'm against people having sex changes. That's not what I'm saying in the slightest. I have many friends who are both transgender as well as uh, transsexual who have gone through the change. I grew up around many people in the LGBTQ uh, community, so I am the last person that is talking on this topic that should be accused of this. However, I do not think that lifestyle choices, however much it might be a mental uh, issue that people face that really feel inadequate and not able to live their lives while they're in that state, I shouldn't be footing the bill. I shouldn't be footing the bill for someone who believes that a physical you know, deformity or other physical appearance issue um, might feel completely unable to be a part of society until they've had that change happen. So whether it's breast augmentation because genetically they just had next to no breasts or if they wanted a nose change because they just happened to have a very prominent or different looking nose. You know, there's a whole range of physical features that can be changed, but th that falls under cosmetic surgery. And you have to save up the money yourself as an individual that wants to make that change. It's not a health issue. It might affect you on a profoundly mental level and we can have compassion for that we can even have charities that help support people in getting that change who can't afford it. Uh, but, you know, why is the Canadian government footing the bill for that? The argument made when that was changed in the recent past was uh, that there's so few that they would let through because there's such a rigorous process before you can have that done. And that's true. It's not that expensive for Canadian taxpayer overall, but and it's just, bizarre that people think that this kind of stuff gets lumped into public money and it's part of the growing uh, problem of socialism that you know it's wanting privilege it's feeling that you're privileged and deserve and uh, can take this from other people to have for yourself so that's the next link below just an article describing that if you want to know more about that and you know that door is open for other things coming down the pipe um, there's probably other examples out there of things that I wouldn't agree with. I've heard talk of like, you know, something like breast enhancement being incorporated into that. You know, I wouldn't agree with that. That's something that if you want to have change, you have to do yourself. The last thing on the list here is that public health care does not implement cutting edge technology fast enough, or even cutting edge therapies. There might be something already existing that now has a new application that is just not being implemented because of incompetence of the system. One thing that always stuck in my mind, which I thought was fascinating, when I was down at Hippocrates many years ago, at the Hippocrates Health Institute in Florida, uh, they talked about hyperbaric oxygen therapy a lot. I think it might have actually been Brian Clement who was talking about it. And he was saying how every street corner, well not literally every street corner, but on every block or any every neighborhood, there should be a 
center where there's a hyperbaric chamber and anyone that suffers a stroke can immediately be put into this chamber and apparently if within the first hour of someone having a stroke or being recognized as having a stroke they're put into a hyperbaric oxygen chamber it massively prevents damage from the stroke uh, being permanent and that makes sense if you can identify it it's a cutoff of oxygen to the brain you get into a pressurized chamber that forces oxygen to every nook and cranny of your body and it's very high oxygen that you're breathing of course it's going to be very beneficial and even medically it's recognized and I'll link to that below in a study that hyperbaric oxygen chambers can uh, really drastically improve the effect and ability of drugs to uh, heal some of the damage from a stroke that's done after a stroke has happened there hasn't been anything as far as I've seen in terms of scientific studies on that first hour window because it's such a critical window there's not a lot of experimentation that's done when someone realizes or when a medical team realizes someone's having a stroke they're not going to start experimenting on people but just like divers that are experiencing the bends which is basically a synthetic stroke if you think of nitrogen bubbles appearing in your bloodstream and kind of doing a similar thing that the stroke does you can have permanent brain damage from it they're put in hyperbaric oxygen chambers to um, save them save their mental faculties, save them from being paralyzed in parts of their body and it works so the fact that this isn't implemented and widely available in more than just hospitals is kind of sad uh, having seen grandparents of mine have strokes or not literally have them but shortly after them having them you know this is stuff that could have saved them and you know 15 years ago this was known to some degree already and it could have been implemented but it's just a tragedy of circumstance of the public health care system and you know the list can be endless as to what we could cover in terms of all the amazing cutting-edge therapies that are just not available to us because of the way the system's set up but they are available around the world in certain more private like uh, healthcare environments which you know if you get enough money you can travel there if you have enough money you can basically go to any private healthcare system on the planet and get that healthcare uh, but we need private health care at the local level all around North America um, not more this public health care with the terrible wait times terrible service terrible um, access to life saving as well as life augmenting therapies so what it comes down to is are all those detriments that I've outlined that come from public health care worth providing free, in quotes, health care to the lowest class of society, the people that can't afford, by technicality means, uh, private health care. If we had private health care under the completely free market system, would it be cost effective enough that the lowest income classes provided a free market system also enabled them to actually have jobs that gave them wages that they could afford this kind of thing with and give them the opportunities to pull themselves up out of you know the slum so to speak I think it makes sense that this system would work better you know a lot of people make the argument that well if you're for private health care you must be against the health care for uh, the people that can't afford it and it's not the case at all it's having equal opportunity to the health care and when you have equal opportunity across the whole spectrum of society people can do what they want with their lives someone that chooses to kill themselves will kill themselves someone that chooses to live on the street is going to live on the street and not going to be able to afford health care when you have more opportunity economically speaking in the workforce it goes hand in hand with more opportunity in terms of your health care and that's what's fair that's what's going to increase the longevity of our society in general not socialist health care not public health care and uh, I feel pretty confident about that it's not just theoretical we can see the elements of it that work we can see the effects of these things I've talked about in varying degrees in different uh, countries around the world and I stand by that I have seen very few arguments for what could come of this as a benefit of having uh, public health care. So I really want to hear from you 
write in the comments below your thoughts on this. Uh, I hope you've watched the whole thing and aren't just uh, going from this gut reaction against such a different concept because so many people seem to be for public health care. Um, but I hope you've taken the time to really analyze these ideas and respond intelligently. So like, favorite, and share the video if you feel so inclined. Um, thank you for watching, and I'll talk to you next time. Take care and embrace life without limits.